so my name is AJ Yagel. The topic we're going to talk about today is mobile user acquisition. Um, it's something that I've got to know well. I've been doing it, I was thinking this morning, for about seven years now. Um, so feel free to ask away. Uh, I'm going to jump into my background really quick to give you some context, um, and that'll be helpful when you're thinking about different questions direct, to direct my way. So most recently, I was a co-founder and uh, president and CEO of a company called Grow Mobile. Uh, we started that back in 2012 catered mainly to uh, top grossing app developers where we managed either all or a portion of their spend. We also worked with a number of large e-commerce companies, uh, bought a Facebook PMD, um, and also had uh, an engagement and segmentation solution. Before that, uh, I was uh, at Zynga, so I spent a lot of time focused on mobile marketing and running the re revenue efforts for mobile. Uh, I did that from 2010 to 2012. And then before that, I spent a lot of time as an affiliate marketer uh, from 2007 to 2010 in various roles working for myself and other companies. Currently, I'm a co-founder of a new startup um, called Soak. We're experimenting with 360 video primarily and its applications to media and advertising. So today, what we're gonna cover, uh, Facebook, Google, I know you guys have touched on them quite a bit so far. We'll spend a little bit more time talking about what's worked for me, what hasn't. Uh, then we're going to talk about tips to maximize your efficiency within those platforms. Since you guys are all on startup budgets, um, you should all be cost conscious, uh, as I'm sure you are. And so how do you get the most bang for your buck? Next we're going to talk about when things are working, how do you actually scale your spend and go into attribution partners, different traffic sources to consider, retargeting. Then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about non-paid strategies, including ASO and Instagram. And then lastly, talking about outsourcing versus hiring a team in-house to do things and questions. Uh, unlike uh, a lot of the people that you may have heard from, I don't have anything to sell you today, so feel free to ask me any questions that you have. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to give you a pretty unbiased opinion. Okay, so if we were to have given this talk four or five years ago, this would have been a much more complex presentation talking about 20 or 50 different traffic sources you should consider. When I think back to my time at Zynga, when we were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a week, up to in the millions, we were using a portfolio of about 50 different channels. You know, for what you guys are looking to do, um, the great news is you really only need to laser focus on two for right now, and that's Facebook and Google. And it, a lot of this is probably obvious information, so I'm not gonna jump into too much detail here, but why, why should you focus on Facebook and Google? First things first, the targeting is great, uh, especially within Facebook, you can really select a specific user. And when you think about Google, there's a lot of demand or intent behind the demand there. And so if you guys are in uh, an industry where there's already demand for your product, it's a great place to consider. They've got low budget requirements. So you can set up campaigns for as low as you know, five to 10 or five to $20 per campaign and, uh, and really kind of experiment at low budgets. The approval times are really fast. I'm sure all of you guys have played around with the Facebook platform so far, but typically ads get approved in less than an hour, uh, which is really, really fantastic. And there are huge opportunities to scale within both platforms. So thinking about Facebook specifically, I've worked with advertisers that have been spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a day really cost effectively making ROI on Facebook. When you talk about Google, I've seen it go into the high tens of thousands. So there's a lot of room to make a lot of money within both platforms to do it cost effectively. So Facebook, what works? So you guys have heard, I'm sure, quite a bit about custom audiences. It's a great place to start. Within Facebook, you should be as specific as possible, um, although testing is really important. So what you should think about doing is basically importing any data that you have. So if you have phone numbers, if you have email addresses for your customers, if you guys are capturing uh, on the web you know, a, a cookie from the user and you can feed that into Facebook, send them all the data that you can. It's gonna help you build uh, interesting custom audiences that are gonna work generally more effectively than broad targeting for your campaigns. And as you guys have probably heard, lookalike targeting really works. And so what you're trying to do is build the biggest uh, you know, set of custom audiences that are actually relevant to your business and then finding lookalike audiences based on them. The lookalike models work with uh, fairly low sets of data. So even if you have you know, tens or hundreds of users that you can load into a custom audience, it's actually gonna be relevant to your campaigns and maybe a better place to start than targeting specifically uh, based on category, based on interest, et cetera. Um, 
although testing is really, really important. And one thing that I found is even if you set up the same Facebook campaign to the exact same audience using the exact same ad, you can get different results each time. So it, it is important to test things out and figure out what makes the most sense for your business. What I found is for broad appeal campaigns, uh, you can generally get a bit more broad with your targeting, and sometimes that can help with your CPI. So when you think about what's a good mobile CPI, if you're thinking about tier one markets, meaning US, UK, Australia, et cetera, you know, I've seen CPIs sustainably in the range of 30 to 50 cents. Uh, and we're talking about broad appeal products like dating, social networking, et cetera. And you know, these advertisers have been able to sustain that level of spend in the tens of thousands of dollars per day. So that's what good looks like. As you get into more specific products, especially B2B, your CPI or your cost per acquisition is uh, obviously going to go up, uh, but you're hopefully driving a higher lifetime value user as well. Be very patient with Facebook, as I'm sure you've heard. Uh, waiting two to three days for your campaigns to kind of mature is a good place to, to see where they actually settle out. Um, so one thing that you'll notice with Facebook specifically is the CPCs, the CPIs will start off high. Uh, that's to be expected. Facebook's testing you across different, pla or different platforms, different placements within their network. And eventually they figure out kind of where you perform the best. Uh, especially if you're passing in data like CPA data, CPI data, et cetera. So waiting two to three days um, and testing with reasonable enough budgets so that you can get some real data uh, is a good place to do that. With that said, you don't want to blow the whole wad on your ad test. So you know, don't start with a huge amount of money. You can literally start with tens of dollars per day or hundreds of dollars per day per creative or per campaign and get directionally good data. Testing and iteration is really, really important within Facebook. Um, so one of the most common mistakes I see marketers make is they give up after a few tests and they decide, okay, Facebook doesn't work for me, Google doesn't work for me. It's really important to kind of stick with it. And once you kind of establish your baseline or at least your primary set of data, how do you iterate on that and make it better? Uh, Facebook works as a platform, so if anybody tells you that it doesn't, um, you know, I, I would probably ignore it and keep trying. Um, Google does as well. And so what you wanna do is figure out how you win within Facebook and Google before you move on to your next platforms because there's a lot of people making money within Facebook today and a lot of people making money within Google. And even as these platforms have gotten more expensive, they've increased the amount of data that they're offering to advertisers so people are still able to keep their costs really, really low. And when I look at some of the top advertisers today, their costs within Facebook and Google may even be lower than what they were paying three or four years ago, and that's because the data is more specific and so they're getting a better quality customer or they're acquiring them for less. So some considerations for B2B. Uh, some of you guys may have B2B companies and I think Facebook does get overlooked quite a bit for the B2B category. Um, one thing to consider when you guys are building a custom audience, so a lot of you guys are startups, you don't have any data or you have minimal data at this point and acquiring a big custom audience is gonna be expensive. One of the tricks that I've seen work is if you go buy pirated email lists or phone number lists for your exact customers and you use those to build lookalikes, it can be a great way to market to the exact people that you want to target. So when you think about going to LinkedIn and sending out messages, the response rate's going to be relatively low. It's really time consuming. I've done it before. You want to kill yourself after the first day and you're not going to do it again. So one strategy to get around that is to take an email list that you've purchased online load that into Facebook, and then start marketing to those users. And assuming you have the marketing budget to do it, that can be a much more effective use of your time, and you can also get a much more qualified user. Go ahead. It's worth trying, yeah. I mean, you'll find enough overlap generally. Um, but if it's all corporate email addresses, the overlap's probably not going to be super high. So what I found is within two to three days worth of data, you can get directionally accurate data. It's not going to be statistically significant, but it should tell you whether, you're not, whether or not you're in range. You can do that within literally like $20, $40 per creative. Um, if you want to get much more accurate, you may want to test at higher levels. But um, I've heard people say as low as $5 can give them a direction on whether or not a banner is working or not. And I mean, one another thing to consider is the value of your conversion. So if you guys are trying to drive you know, a, a sale that's worth thousands and thousands of dollars, you're gonna have to experiment with, uh, with quite a bit more testing to get to your results. So those numbers are generally for consumer, uh, low cost per conversion. 
And then one other thing to test on the B2B side um, that I've seen work is using Facebook to drive kind of the first interaction with your audience and then using your email funnel or other follow-up sequences to build a deeper relationship with them. One of the most common things that I'm seeing working right now is people offering up something of high value, like a report that's actually well tailored to their audience that looks more like content than a sales pitch. When somebody goes to click on it, then they have to subscribe or you know, give you their email to, uh, to download the content. And then you can use that content to actually sell them or better qualify them on your product. The next thing to mention is that generally from what I've seen, stock images don't work. And so if you guys are thinking about using stock images, probably don't do it. Uh, there are a lot of sources where you can get Creative Commons photos uh, for free. So you can look at Pinterest, you can look at Flickr. Um, there's a lot of sources out there. Uh, test out Creative because Creative makes a huge difference. And I think you'd be surprised that wacky Creative works really, really well for consumer. And for B2B, you have to be a bit more creative depending on what you're actually trying to sell. But something that looks more personal, something that looks like it's gonna shock them, catch their attention, you know, be heartwarming, is probably gonna click through better than you know, a standard picture of a coffee cup and a guy at his computer. So when I was putting this presentation together yesterday, I just pulled a couple of examples that I saw in my mobile feed um, to give you examples of things that are working and how you should think about the ad units. So on the left-hand side, I see uh, an ad for Meal Pass. What was interesting about this ad is, so the creator's pretty good. It kind of looks like a stock image, uh, but it's a sushi Rito, and you know, coming from San Francisco, you can at least identify with that. They served it to me around meal time, so I got the ad, I think, at about 1.30 in the afternoon. So I was still hungry, um, so I had a higher intent to actually click on the ad. The ad was intriguing, so they mentioned that you can eat for $6 a day in San Francisco, that's a pretty big promise, um, so that's interesting. Um, and they targeted it to me in my city and made it clear that this was specific to San Francisco. So if you think about that as a user, you're gonna be much more likely to click on that specific ad than you are something that's broad appeal. And because of that, they can typically get a higher value user out of you and drive a lower cost per action. On the right hand side, you see a video. Uh, so this is a company I'm not familiar with. I see they're a San Francisco based company called Good & Company. The title indicates that they've got a big value proposition. It's kind of a mouthful and that may work for them. But if you see there's more text than most people are gonna read, the way that they're getting around that, and I'm not gonna say that this is a great ad, but this is at least probably effective for them if they're running it. They're using a video to further qualify the user. So one of the things that you can try if you've got a more complex sale, something in the higher value uh, conversion range, is run a video. And Facebook supports up to a 60 minute video. So if you think about it, if you can really keep the user engaged, you can sell to them for up to 60 minutes and then get them to click on your link. So if you're driving a you know, multi-thousand dollar conversion, you can afford to pay a dollar plus per click and typically the funnel will make sense. You see a lot of the uh, B2B and you know, I would say wealth focused advertisers focusing on, are focusing on this right now. So they'll do different things like showing you their lifestyle at the pool, using the attractive image of the pool to hook you in and then selling you on how you can live the dream and then you go ahead to click and then you can either attend their seminar or buy their product, et cetera. Uh, but if you guys are selling a more complex product and the ad unit itself isn't really going to get the user intrigued, then use video uh, as a supplement to your landing page. Moving on to Google. So you guys have already spent time on Google, uh, but just to give you a refresher, Google has four products that work for mobile. You've got AdWords first and foremost, the Google Display Network, which used to be AdMob and has evolved since then. You've got YouTube, and then you've got uh, shopping campaigns. So talking briefly about each, um, AdWords should generally be your starting point. So if there's demand for your product, let's say that you're an e-commerce company, a ride sharing company, a travel company, and things that people are actively searching for, you should be in the Google results. A uh, Couple of reasons, there's already intent there. So while it may actually cost you more to acquire that user, uh, you generally can back out into a higher lifetime value. The second thing is your competitors are probably also doing the exact same thing and you've got the opportunity to bid on competitive keywords within the search platforms. So think about Google AdWords as a starting place. It's not gonna be the highest volume traffic source that you have unless you're in a really high demand category, but typically the users that you're getting are higher quality and you should be there from a competitive standpoint anyway. The next is the Google Display Network. So this is how you scale potentially within Google, especially if you're on the consumer side or have a broad appeal application. 
So with games specifically, or different entertainment apps, dating, uh, the Google Display Network can work really well. I've seen it drive you know tens of thousands of dollars a day in uh, successful spend for advertisers. Um, think about those as the ad mob banner units that you're typically used to seeing around the web. Um, so whether you're on mobile web or you're within an app experience, they're the small banner units that are running at the bottom of the page. They're the interstitial placements that are showing up in between game plays or you know, the, an overlay that's showing on a website. Um, and so it's not gonna be the most qualified ad unit. If you think about a banner, there's really only so much that you can say in a banner or an interstitial, but it can provide a huge amount of scale because that network is gigantic and it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest display networks out there. The next is YouTube, uh, which relatively is a newer product, but is really effective. So we saw specifically with entertainment clients in my past company, Grow Mobile, that you can really use uh, YouTube to, to drive a lot of scale, especially if you're in the entertainment category. So when you think about buying outside of Facebook or platforms where there's really a lot of data on a specific user, you need to think about matching different categories. So we know generally that YouTube is an entertainment application, so the people there are bored, they're looking for entertainment. So if you serve them things that you know, are tailored to that interest, they're generally gonna perform better, both from a conversion standpoint and from a lifetime value standpoint. Although Google does have a lot of supplementary data on its users, and so there are different ways that you can use YouTube to drive conversions for more complex products uh, and things outside of consumer, although consumer is probably where the majority of the evergreen spend comes from within that platform. The next is shopping. Go ahead. So the, the question was, if you're using YouTube, should you drive the user to a landing page or should you remarket to them later uh, or drive them to an app store, et cetera? Um, it, it generally depends on the value of your conversion. So if you've got a high value conversion, let's say that you're trying to get them to opt into uh, a list and you're gonna sell them on a seminar, bring them to a landing page. If you're gonna try to promote an app download, generally bring them directly to uh, the Google Play page or the app store page. Uh, for conversions, typically sub like five to seven dollars. Typically, removing a click in the process generally helps the cause. Uh, but if you can come up with a really effective funnel to get the user to jump quickly and actually motivate them more in the middle, then that can be an effective way to do it. So the question was: Do you see uh, similar results for entertainment products on YouTube as education products? Um, to be honest, I haven't promoted too many education products on uh, YouTube, and I'm sure there probably aren't too many people that have done it. So it's Greenfield, and it's worth experimenting. Okay, and talking about the last category, which is shopping campaigns, which may or may not be relevant for you guys. If you guys are a physical product owner and you're trying to move merchandise and you control the end shopping experience with your user, meaning that um, they're going to your website or they're going to your app and they're actually purchasing from you, not Amazon or a third party like Walmart, then you can use Google Shopping campaigns. And that way your products can appear within the search feed if somebody is searching for something specific. So for example, my wife sells baby blankets. With uh, her product, she can list it within the Google search results so that when you're searching for, Google, uh, for baby blankets, you can buy it directly through Google Shopping campaigns as opposed to you know, finding the Amazon link. So why AdWords? We've talked about uh, the intent behind the searches, so you know that the user's already qualified, uh, but why, why should this be at the top of your list? And the reason being, so Google, Google's showing these ads on uh, search feeds, so whether you're on a Safari browser on your iOS device and you're searching for something specific, in this case, I was searching for strategy games, and the first ad that was showed to me was Empire Four Kingdoms, a successful strategy game. That's a great way to find somebody when they're ready to take action. On the right-hand side, you see the Google Play search results, and this should be really uh, intriguing for you if you're promoting with an Android. Because the user's already searching for something specific in the Google Play Store, this is where you wanna be. You wanna show them an ad that's related to what you're trying to do and you, you know the user's gonna be qualified, you know that there's gonna be high conversion rate, so then it just comes down to competition and what you're willing to pay to get the user versus your competitor. Tips to maximize efficiency. So how do you spend your money as cost effectively as possible? What I've always found in the past is don't try to reinvent the wheel, copy what's working, uh, especially because you're a startup. You're probably the most creative people in the world 
but somebody else has had you know the luxury of huge budgets and a lot longer to test and figure out what works. So copy what they're doing and get your baseline. And it doesn't mean copy word for word, but try to figure out what placements they're running. Try to figure out what style of advertising they're running, you know, whether that's video or banner, what they're showing within the banner, generally what colors they're showing within the banner. You know, if they're running a, a search ad, try to figure out what keywords they're running. Uh, there are a lot of great tools to do this. So there's plenty of spy tools out there. Um, there are even some free ones. So in the past, I've experimented on the free side. Ad Espresso is a Facebook PMD that's got a, a free tool that'll show you some ads. So that's a starting point. There's another uh, PPC specific one called Ispionage, and the list goes on. I think there's 10 per category that you can experiment with. In the beginning, unless you've got big budgets, just use some of the free tools to, to glimmer what you can. Uh, when you're within Facebook or Google or any of the other platforms that you're you know, actively following, keep a swipe file of ads. So look at what your competitors are doing. See how many times they're showing up. You know, try to decode what works and what doesn't work. Save them and then create your own ads and use those as the baseline to understand what generally good looks like for you. Then it's important to get creative and see if you can spin the ads and see if you can be you know, much more interesting than your competitors um, and, and iterate to drive a lower cost per sale or higher lifetime value or whatever you're going for. One thing that I found is you know, even the best marketers aren't always the most creative people and they're not always gonna be the most creative people for every different topic. So this is a great place to get more people from your team involved. Even if they're not on the marketing team, they could even be from the finance team. People have different ideas about what's gonna work and it's important to listen to them. And if you're thinking about bringing in uh, an outside consultant, that can also be a place to get some creative feedback to supplement your own. Test with small budgets, as we talked about earlier. Um, because you guys are you know, smaller startups, um, don't spend thousands of dollars a day to figure out what the most uh, or the best performing creative is going to be. You can start with tens of dollars or hundreds of dollars and still get to directionally similar results. Refresh creative uh, frequently. So the Facebook expert that talked to you probably told you that that's one of the most important things within their platform. If you're spending at scale, you need to be refreshing your ad creative. I would say at a minimum once every week or two weeks. Uh, but if you're spending at high scale, it could be you know, multiple times per day. And then uh, one thing to consider is using a Facebook marketing partner. Um, if you value your time, I find that Facebook's tools really take me a lot of time. So if you want to test at any level of scale, Generally in the hundreds or thousands of dollars a day, that can be a way to save some of your time so that you're not you know, wasting it creating ads and waiting for the, the power editor to load. So now how to scale. Um, so once you've mastered Facebook and Google, where we already know you can spend you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a day, there are a lot of other platforms out there that could be meaningful for your business. If you're already hitting diminishing points of return within Facebook and Google, it's worth considering too. Um, so first, you'll need a tracking provider. And I'm sure you've seen the names on the list before. You've got Tune, Adjust, Coachaba, Apps Flyer, and then there's some new up-and-comers like Tengen and Singular. Uh, they're all pretty good solutions at this point. Uh, the first four that I mentioned are relatively proven. You, know, you can take a demo of each and see which features you know, matter the most to your business, what pricing makes the most sense. You know, typically, I found that these solutions are premium solutions. They're expensive. Um, I think save Apps Flyer. And it may be considered, or may be a good thing to consider as you're thinking about ad networks and things outside of Facebook and Google. Um, and if you're keeping your spend, uh, well, if you're ready to take your spend to the next level, then think about one of these guys. So when you're ready to expand, what traffic sources do you think about? So if you're on the consumer side, um, the first group that I would think about are the video ad networks. So some of them are incentivized, some of them aren't. There are a lot of them that are specific to mobile. So if you think about Unity ads, you think about Ad Colony, you think about Fiverr, you think about NativeX, there's a long list of them, Vungle, et cetera. Um, the five or six top video ad networks typically drive more results than the banner networks for the bigger advertisers. So that's a place to consider. Uh, and generally what you're serving is a short form video anywhere from on the low side seven seconds up to 60 seconds. Um, or somewhere in between. And what you're trying to do is excite somebody about your product, so by the time they get to an incentivized video ad, then they have a, a non-incentivized option to download it. And from what I've seen, there's a pretty good trade-off between both the volume that you're gonna get on a daily basis and the quality that you're gonna get out of the user. And it's possible to spend collectively in the tens of thousands of dollars, if not more, on all those channels. 
Yahoo's a good channel, particularly if you're trying to reach somebody that's uh, kind of in an older demographic or very specific to one of their sections within you know, Yahoo. So Yahoo's got a really active sports and fantasy section if you're doing e-gaming. If you're doing finance, Yahoo Finance is still kind of a stalwart where a lot of people are spending their time. And then of course, uh, they have a large female audience um, that from what I've seen in the past converts fairly well. Trustworthy DSPs. So I think there's something like 600 ad networks and DSPs out there. Um, most of them don't add a lot of value in the equation, to be honest. Um, and a lot of them are gonna sell you on the world. So be very skeptical and ask for references. But there are some good ones out there. Um, from my experience in the past, uh, there's some local guys named Cross Install that do a good job with their playable ad units. Life Street is a company in San Francisco as well that does a pretty good job. App Eleven is another that uh, has a DSP and their own ad network that does fairly well. Um, so there are great sources to, to check out here. Uh, ask your friends for references. And if somebody's pitching you and it sounds like it's too good to be true or you see the data and it's too good to be true, it probably is. Um, and there's a lot of fraud out there as well. So make sure that when you're running these campaigns, you know where the ads are actually being shown and, uh, and look at the data to make sure that everything looks kosher. The next would be traditional banner networks like Millennial Media and Mobi. Um, those are great options if you're trying to scale as well. Um, and then the up and comers to look for Apple search ads and Snapchat. Uh, so those are both new, but I think that those probably have more potential than everything else that I mentioned on the list outside of Facebook and Google. Uh, people are experimenting with them now. Um, the bigger advertisers are in their betas, so talk to them, see how their campaigns are doing. And you know, if they are working, it, it's worth jumping in early because typically that's where all the arbitrage is. Retargeting is something to consider. Um, it's not the first thing that I would do, but if you guys are looking to um, try to get more out of the user or you're looking to drive down the CPA, it's definitely something to consider. And you guys have probably already heard about customer segmentation and how you can slice your audience. Um, I would think about using that data to either drive a purchase. You can uh, serve event-based promotions to somebody. So for example, if you're running a sale, um, that may be a good way to get back in touch with them. You can push the user through your funnel, so you know if that they dropped off after submitting their email address, maybe you push them to you know, engage deeper with your product. Driving a lapsed user to re-engage, uh, if you find that lapsed users are actually valuable to your business, then do it. Uh, for a game company or a broad consumer company, it may be a waste of money. And then it's also a way to push new content to your users. So if you're a content business, think about like a Vice Media, you could basically re-engage your users, and uh, as long as your ads are targeted well, you could drive a reasonable CPC. To start off, I would also think about Facebook and Google. Uh, I sound like a broken record at this point, but uh, they are really cost effective. And as you're looking to scale to the broader RTB ecosystem, consider Critio and AdRoll to uh, manage the spends. There are other companies out there like Retargeter and others in that category. On the non-paid side, so I'll be the first to say that I'm not an expert on the non-paid side, but I have seen quite a bit. Um, ASO probably won't move the needle in a big way for you guys but it, it is worth considering. And when you are thinking about entering the right keywords, you know, think about uh, the trade-offs between you know, competition and search volume. One of the ways that you can do that uh, for free is there's a tool called Searchman um, where you can go on and you don't even need to sign up. You just put in a competitor app or your own app and you can see um, how all the different keywords stack up against each other. There are also a long list of ASO companies that offer premium services that do something similar. But I've always found that in the past, you know, what you want to do is make sure that the keywords that you are entering are relevant to your business. Just because something is low competition and high search doesn't mean you necessarily want the user. Uh, if you're trying to drive something that's more complex, you know, be thoughtful about the keywords you put in, but also go into a tool like this and check to make sure that somebody's actually searching for them. Because the last thing you want is a really qualified keyword and no search volume. The last non-paid strategy that I'm going to talk about is Instagram. Um, so I haven't seen everybody using Instagram to drive app downloads, but there are companies that are doing it cost, of, cost effectively and at some version of scale. So the one company that I've been following is Musical.ly, which is a Chinese-based company um, that stayed up in the top of the app store with two of their apps for the past six plus months. And they're consistently in the top 20s. So how are they doing this? Outside of the other paid efforts that they're doing, uh, the one channel that I've seen consistently grow and be effective for them is Instagram. And so what they're doing is they basically are cross-promoting their users within Instagram. And as they've gotten bigger, they've done celebrity partnerships to drive users to their Instagram account where they're promoting their own application. Um, 
they also run contests and different things to try to get shout outs within the platform. So they're using that as a funnel uh, to basically drive app downloads. And you know, if you've got 7.3 million followers, you really only need to convert you know, a small percentage of their friends on a daily basis to drive consistent growth for your application. So, so what they'll do, for example, we'll talk about a celebrity first. So it could be Britney Spears. So Britney Spears probably has tens of millions of Instagram followers. So what they'll do is they'll partner with Britney Spears. They'll get Britney Spears to shout them out to her followers. That drives people back to Musical.ly. And then they're promoting her music to Musical.ly users. So there's basically an exchange of value there. From what I could tell, they, they didn't start with Britney Spears. That's obviously expensive, and it's going to be out of the budget and connections of most startups. But they started off with smaller people that had a meaningful audience, and they promoted them there. Um, they also picked different people that were going to be champions for their platform. And they really made them stars within the platform, promoted them within their own Instagram. So for example, they would post to Musical.ly. They would basically cry, you know, promote that post and say, hey, come check out this girl, Baby Ariel, who's doing great things. She would get a lot of likes. She was pumped about it. She would tweet it to her friends. She would bring people back to either their Instagram or their app. And then they've just basically scaled up from there and done it with more influencers. So the last question I'm going to address is, uh, do you outsource or do you do everything in-house? Uh, it was one of the most frequently asked questions when I did Grow Mobile, which was a combination between a platform and an agency. So I would consider outsourcing if you're enter entering an international market and you need the cultural know-how, uh, which I know may be relevant uh, for some of you guys and for some of the international folks that are tuned in here. Um, back to the you know, creative question, how do you create ads that actually resonate with your audience? It generally takes know-how, and you know if you guys aren't in a local market, um, you're only going to be able to guess what they like so much. So think about leveraging expertise there. If you've got a solid grasp on what good looks like, you guys have already done testing yourself, and you're looking to scale, and you can more cost-effectively scale by bringing in an outsource partner, I think that's a good way to do it. And if you need more creative firepower, people that are going to help you brainstorm ads, that's another way to consider it. Um, the biggest startup that I've seen, or the biggest mistake that I've seen startups make, is thinking that they can outsource it to somebody entirely and have that person do an excellent job. I mean, the reality is, I mean, I've been a consultant myself. You only care so much about a business that you're consulting for, and at the end of the day, I mean, this is probably your livelihood for most of your businesses. And so, the founders or whoever is the most apt to deal with it on the team should be spending a, a good amount of time and designate a point of accountability. So there are great consultants out there. There's great agencies you can work with. Uh, but make sure somebody internally is looking at the metrics and making sure that everybody's making progress together and that you're keeping some of the knowledge in-house. All right, lastly, I'm going to turn it over to questions if there are any left. Yeah, so, so the question is, how can you use uh, strategies to effectively promote an app that you don't need at this exact instant? So the example is Hotel Tonight. I think this is true for a lot of the travel industry as a whole. It's one of the biggest problems and opportunities for them. I would think about um, different ways that you can re-engage the user after you get them to download. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be from a paid standpoint. If you guys are using uh, a segmentation solution, like we had one at Grow Mobile, there's other companies like Appboy, Kahuna. And you can identify where they are uh, and attribute some likelihood to them taking an action. So for example, I downloaded in San Francisco. I've seen that you know this user spends a lot of his time in San Francisco. All of a sudden, he's in New York. Um, it may be worth sending him a push notification or an email to let him know that there's uh, a sale available. You know, generally, these apps do pretty well also within you know Facebook, Google, some of the ad networks. Um, so they can drive a rel relatively low cost per action, cost per install. Um, so it's not uncommon to see you know installs in the one, two, three dollar range in tier one markets. But then the question becomes: after you get the user to download, how do you get them to keep reengaging with your app? And uh, that's a creative challenge, and you just need to think about it through retargeting, remarketing. Question in the back. So before I repeat the question, I'm going to have you elaborate a bit more. So can you uh, can you name some of the companies specifically, just so that I have more context? Sure. 
Okay, so the question is, um, can I comment more on uh, networks that will price per install or based off of some install guarantee? Is that correct? So in general, when you go outside of Facebook and Google, pretty much everybody uh, will price off of the install. There are some exceptions like Ad Colony and others, but generally most of these guys are going to take a, a CPI campaign, um, especially if you're willing to put a budget behind it. The challenge to going off of Facebook and Google is most of these guys are going to require a minimum budget somewhere along the lines of five, ten, twenty thousand dollars to get started. Uh, but if you are willing to start there, the way to do those contracts is you put a cancellation clause in the contract that allows you to cancel after 24 hours. You give them a cost per install, and then you're basically optimizing, comparing your cost per install to you know your LTV cost per sale, etc. But m most companies will support it, and it, it's a fair ask to demand it. Even if they start off by asking you for a CPCV or a CPC or a CPM, try to push for a CPI and see what their breaking point is. It, good question. So I think from what I understand about liftoffs business, I'm not an expert by any means, they're pricing off the CPA or they're, they're trying to optimize down to the cost per action. It's definitely a great trend in general. So you know everybody wants to pay for the result that they're looking to compare against their revenue. And so that, that's a great starting point. Um, the one caveat to it is you generally have to spend at quite a bit more scale to get to that point. So for them to optimize, you know, if they're only driving one conversion per 100 downloads that are happening, they need to get a lot more data for them to actually optimize. Um, so think about that within your models. And you know, that can take hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in spend to get to any level of statistical accurate, or accurate, uh, accuracy. But, you know, they've got a bunch of good data already. You know, leverage them, see what they can do for you. Question? What type of application do you have? It's a good question. Um, so the, the question was, how do you get a user that's downloaded the desktop app to come back to the mobile app, or vice versa? Yeah. So one of the things you could consider is, uh, you know, Facebook and Google and anybody that has first-party data knows who that user is on both platforms. So what I would do is just set up a campaign to specifically target that user on the other platform. Um, so you could go, to, you know, put in your custom audience, and then just basically remarket to that user on whatever platform you want to drive them back into. All right, that looks like it's going to wrap it up. Thanks so much, guys.